My name is Don Linke. It is July 5, 2006. We're here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics on the campus of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey in New Brunswick. This is another in the series of interviews for the Brendan T. Byrne Archive conducted for the Rutgers program on the governor. Uh, today we'll be talking with Patricia Sheehan, who served as mayor of New Brunswick as a commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs and as an executive with Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Mrs. Sheehan has been one of the pioneering women in New Jersey politics and we'll be talking to her today about her career and particularly about her uh, relationship and involvement uh, in the administration of Governor Brendan T. Byrne. Here in uh, July 2006 I'd like you to reflect before we get into the specifics of your career and of your participation in the Byrne administration and other political roles, but how has New Jersey changed in your sort of professional career from the 70s uh, till now? Uh, and is it for the good or the worse? Well, I suppose it's like any other answer. There's some good and there's some bad. Um, I think that there's an immediacy and, and frankly, a meanness in uh, government and politics today that uh, uh, we in the 70s didn't have to suffer from or for or to um, this instant communication, the email, the, the blogs, all of the uh, um, self-gratification that comes by instant response doesn't allow much time for reflection or considered response or uh, working out details. Uh, and in some ways I think we had that luxury. Um, we also had um, an opportunity to disagree but not to uh, kind of go for the jugular on each and every issue, there was some uh, some respect for private life. There was some uh, respect for positions other than your own, and um, I don't think we see very much of that today. Uh, on the other hand, certainly we're able uh, with not only the technology in terms of communication but in terms of construction, in terms of education, to expand our reach. Um, I just don't feel that we're doing it as much for the citizens and uh, that there's still a uh, deep down public service citizen representation. Uh, I think that's fading away. Also, as we uh, talk today, the state government for the first time in its history has actually shut down its operations because the governor and the legislature can't agree on a new budget. Uh, in terms of the government, the uh, state government today versus the state government in the 70s, uh, again, uh, are we better today? Are we worse today? Is the governor's role weaker than it was in the 1970s during the Byrne administration? Are you unhappy about uh, the situation, particularly uh, today, as we sit with a state government that can't operate because it has no money? Well, I think we're in uncharted waters. I mean, this has never happened before. Uh, we did a lot of brinkmanship. Uh, we uh, didn't always get the budget in on uh, midnight of June 30th or 12.01 uh, a.m. on the 1st, however the, the law reads. Uh, so perhaps we fudged a little on the time, but everybody got a budget in. I mean, this is unheard of. It's unconscionable. Um, I, I'm sure there's enough blame to go around for everyone. I don't think it's um, one party or another, one governor or another, less powerful, more powerful. I, I think it's um, appalling. Um, but by the same token, I never faced that situation, nor did Brendan. And um, I don't know how it's going to come out. I, 
was never good at a crystal ball. <laughs> but I think that real people are suffering real pain. And perhaps it was glossed over with the holiday weekend. People didn't really understand uh, that this was going to have a direct and immediate impact on them. Um, and as usual, um, people are going to suffer. And that's, they should be able to expect more from their government, not this enforced suffering. Mm -hmm. And again, given the luxury of time and the perspective that these past 30 or so years have given us, what do you see as sort of the lasting accomplishments of the Byrne administration and also perhaps some of the disappointments, things that may not have gotten done during Brendan Byrne's time in office? Well, certainly I think the accomplishments are out there for all to see, um, starting with the fact that we always had a budget. <laughs> have to emphasize that point in these days. But um, when you think about um, casino gambling, you think about the development of the Meadowlands, uh, you think about the protection of the Pinelands, um, you can't but not think of the income tax. I think that um, uh, Brendan was able to build on um, little uh, foundations, if you will, and go forward in, in a very dramatic way um, that didn't lose sight of the fact that we had people to serve and that in many instances not having to act uh, or not being able to act or being unwilling to act would have meant um, permanent differences. Um, I mean, once the Pinelands was gone, there was no bringing it back. Um, once the um, uh, Meadowlands was left to warehouses and rutted roads, it would have taken 20 more years to bring it forward. Um, left to uh, uh, an unwillingness on the part of much of the country, there would have been no Section 8 housing without the administration of, of Brendan Byrne, not only here in New Jersey, but anywhere, because Washington clearly didn't want it to work. They were out of the public housing business, and they'd set up a, a program that they were able to say was going to provide an alternative that was bigger, better, and cheaper. And what they meant was they weren't going to build any subsidized housing. Um, so I think those were just some, off the top of my head, key issues that made a difference because um, people sincerely wanted things to be better for someone besides themselves. What about disappointments? Uh, the Byrne administration famously passed the first state income tax in New Jersey. Uh, there was probably some thought at the time, well, the state's fiscal house was now put in order that uh, we had bitten the bullet and use any other cliche you want. But today, 30 years later, some of the same issues, some of the same political debates are, are going on. Was that a disappointment that uh, uh, that issue just doesn't go away in New Jersey, that it continues to linger? Uh... Well, it's an ongoing disappointment. Property taxes are too high in New Jersey. The reliance on the property tax is too strong in New Jersey. If you work a minimum wage job today in 2006, and you work 40 hours a week, and then you have a part-time job somewhere else, you can't afford to live in New Jersey. There is no housing for you in New Jersey. And so uh, the fact that we had an income tax, I think we really believed that that would make a difference. And um, that didn't happen. So here we are 30 some years later, and the problem isn't, is not only not better, it's worse. And um, I have to say, and I come out of uh, local government, and home rule is the sacred cow, 
But if you have uh, 611 school districts and 566 now municipalities and 21 counties, all of them with an in infrastructure that is in fact paying a living wage, um, you can't have somebody's 25 foot by 100 lot supporting all of that. And uh, we don't seem to be able to fix it. What about the state of the cities? Uh, the Byrne administration placed a high priority, particularly through your own Department of Community Affairs, on revitalizing New Jersey cities, uh, sitting today in 2006. There's obviously been some improvement in some of the cities, but other cities, uh, Camden, perhaps Patterson, probably aren't much better than they were in the 70s. Uh, do you think that's another disappointment? Well, it's certainly a disappointment to me personally that we haven't reached nirvana. Um, uh, my commitment, uh, my charge, if you will, from Brendan was uh, the community, all of the communities, but particularly the cities of New Jersey. Um, I followed after uh, Governor Hughes established the department with Paul Ilvesacker. And uh, the mission was to aid and abet the cities. And um, I was mayor at that time. And um, so there was no other place in state government that I felt either that I was qualified to be in or that I wanted to be in. And um, I can say that um, certainly we haven't done enough. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, I think things are better. I think they could have been worse. Um, there was a general move to the suburbs, not only of uh, of families and homes, but uh, of jobs and highways, and uh, a, a distinct move to turn their backs on the cities. I mean, uh, by and large, society was content to have uh, the cities be warehouses of the poor, the disabled, uh, the handicapped, um, the neediest in our society uh, were left in the cities without any recourse in terms of providing the kinds of services that uh, it's a little bit like the child that leaves home, having been cared for and nurtured and provided with all the amenities. Now they're on their way out to start their own lives and their own families, and uh, they don't look back. And that's virtually what happened to the cities. I mean, you talk so much today about unintended consequences. Uh, there was nothing better, uh, in my judgment, than the GI Bill and the uh, VA mortgages. I mean, we owe the young men and women who fought in World War II uh, a debt of gratitude, certainly. But in effect, that slammed the door on the cities. The housing stock in the cities was not eligible for a VA mortgage. The car and the new highways meant people could leave the cities. And so the cities had provided the water, the sewers, the infrastructure, the hospitals, the library, the schools, everything for the surrounding area. And now suddenly the government was subsidizing the housing and the roads and the education and the jobs for people to move out of the cities to have a bigger and better life. And that's all to the good. But they never looked back. And um, uh, I know you talked earlier about Atlantic City. Well, the people in Atlantic City uh, who could not be needier, but when you look at the demographics of the population uh, and you have uh, the, the old and the elderly and the uh, disabled and the handicapped and the uh, mentally disturbed making up 60, 70, 80 percent of your population, it's all very well to say, oh, well, why don't they get a job? Why I've made it. Why don't they make it? They don't have any resources to make it. And so, uh, and we had a sentiment that uh, uh, the cities were bad places and let's close our eyes and walk away from it. And so 
30 years ago we had a lot to do, and 30 years later there's still a lot to do. But I think there's a recognition, and uh, certainly when you see Jersey City and the Gold Coast, uh, when you see New Brunswick, uh, when you see some the Ironbound Forest Hills in Newark, um, there is a, an indication, and I think, eternally optimistic about the cities, that uh, if you have a mix in population and you have some opportunity uh, to be involved and participate, things get better. And I think we're seeing some of that. So, no, it didn't work. There was no nirvana, but, but I think we held our thumb in the dike long enough and too long. But nonetheless, things didn't get worse. I think in many cases they got better and are continuing to thrive, or in some instances beginning to thrive. You're a native New Jerseyan. You were yes. born in 1934 in yeah. York. Indeed. Why don't we get a somewhat personal? What was your family background, and what are your sort of early memories uh, of New Jersey and the places that you lived? Well, uh, my mother and father were both immigrants. They were each born in Ireland. Uh, they met in Newark and uh, uh, lived in Newark uh, all their lives. Uh, I've always lived in New Jersey. Um, well, that's not strictly true. I went to school and worked for several years in Washington, D.C. But uh, I'm, I'm truly a Jersey girl and, and quite proud of it. Um, I didn't realize how proud I was of it un, until I went away to school and uh, met uh, young women from around the country and everybody talked about you know what was so great from where they were from. And I realized that uh, no matter what they said, we had it in New Jersey. We had mountains, we had the beach, we had uh, uh, the cities, we had access to New York and Philadelphia, we had tomatoes, corn, and blueberries, uh, we had farms, da da da. And so uh, I discovered when I went away that New Jersey really had everything and that's where I wanted to be. And that's where I've been ever since. What are your early memories of Newark? Uh, well, one thing is um, that you could get anywhere by bus, uh, which we were all inclined to do. I grew up in a uh, Catholic parish, and there was a network of um, what we called in those days uh, CYO clubs. And um, I didn't know we were poor because nobody I knew had any money. We all did the same thing. Uh, but they had dances with records, final 78 or whatever uh, records, and they stamped your hand, and for a bus ride and a quarter, uh, there were Friday night dances and Saturday night dances. There were uh, uh, shows at the Mosque Theater. There was a newsreel theater in, on Broad Street in Newark. My father was not a movie fan, uh, but he would descend or condescend, I suppose, uh, to go to the newsreel theater. And I was not a fan of newsreels, but they did have a cartoon, and I was sure of a candy bar. So that was often a Sunday outing. Um, Week Lake Park. I mean, it was a whole, but, I mean, I grew up so long ago uh, that it could be, you know, all in sepia. It, uh, uh, you did things by bus. Uh, there was no television. Uh, radio was was the thing. Uh, there were truly neighborhoods. I mean, everybody knew you, uh, and every you were accountable to everybody as well. Uh, certainly, there were no street gangs. Uh, Mrs. So and So up the street, and Mr. So and So in the corner store uh, wouldn't have permitted it. Uh, neither would the uh, police officer. There was a neighborhood policeman. So it was a whole different life. I don't think that has anything to do with, uh, with Newark or New Jersey per se. It's just that I'm getting old. How strong was the Irish identity at that time in Newark? Did you hang pretty much with uh, other uh, Irish uh, American families? Not really. Um, it was more a melting pot neighborhood. I think uh, 
certainly my mom and dad did. Uh, there were uh, a whole variety of clubs in uh, Kearney and Harrison uh, that were dedicated Irish-American clubs of one kind or another. And uh, many of, at least in my mother's case, many of her friends had emigrated as well. And uh, so she had uh, uh, those contacts. And in my dad's case, his father and one of his aunts were the only two out of nine that did not emigrate to New Jersey. So there was a, uh, a big gang of uh, Queenans around in Newark, in Trenton, and in uh, Patterson. And so there was, um, I say, I think. You could say we were ghettoized uh, to the extent of our family and their friends, but we grew up American. I mean, I think the most important piece of paper that my father owned was his citizenship papers. And um, there was no, um, no, it, it was more than neighborhood, and it was mixed, uh, uh, different ethnic groups. There were. And that's a difference that we've talked about many times in terms of the school systems and the uh, Americans generally who are not too good in languages. Uh, in, uh, in my day, most of the non-English speaking families had a grandmother or a grandfather who did not speak English, whether it was Italian or Polish or German, which happened to be the groups where I grew up. Um, there was one. And um, you never learned that language in school. Those kids were discouraged from mentioning that. And it wasn't until they had children of their own that they began to have children who would learn another language. And uh, so there was a big drive uh, uh, to be assimilated, I suppose that's the word. And what did your father do for a living? My father was in construction. He was a, a union man with the 696 local out of Newark, uh, sprinkler fitters, plumbers, and so on. And i um, very proud of that as well. My mother did not work outside the home, uh, but she kept us together. It was just the three of us. Of course, they're passed on now. Do you recall how your father's union membership and activity uh, affected you? Was that something that maybe pushed you later in life into a political career? Well, it was something he was very proud of. Uh, uh, and certainly I was. Uh, he, I can remember uh, several times, uh, just to show you how times have changed, uh, he was often on the negotiating team. And while he did not uh, share any confidences or secrets about uh, contract negotiations, I do remember a time that there was a, uh, a standoff, if you will, it took a while for uh, uh, the negotiations to be worked out because the union insisted that the, um, the men, with all men, uh, had to be paid in cash. And of course, we were coming into, I guess, the checkbook era, and it was simpler, easier, and safer for the, um, uh, the jobs to use checks. But the problem with checks was that uh, the only place, if you weren't a check person, the only place you could cash them was in a bar, and that put the paycheck at jeopardy. And so that was a union issue. I mean, it's hard to conceive now when you talk about internet and ATM cards and the, the rest of it. Uh, but uh, the, the protection of the membership and the workers was something that certainly was beat into my head, and that's just a kind of offside example. Um, in terms of politics, he had a real dilemma in that um, I was his daughter, so A, I could do no wrong, and B, I was certainly fit, able, and smart enough to be anything I wanted to be in his eyes, 
pretty hard standard to try to reach. But on the other hand, um, a concept that was totally alien to him was what he called petticoat government. So in many ways, I was uh, just as well pleased that he lived in Newark and I lived in New Brunswick. And so the question of whether or not he'd vote for a woman uh, didn't come up. So uh, he always suffered from that dichotomy. Well, you're born in 1934. Do you have any vivid memories of the Depression. Uh, you said that uh, you didn't realize you were poor because everyone was sort of at the same level, but did the Depression affect you? Did your father keep his uh, job uh, through the Depression? And my father worked through the Depression, uh, as far as I know. Um, I don't, I, more of my recollection of the Depression is from uh, comments my mother would make uh, years later, uh, and things like that um, Antiques Roadshow. She would often make a comment, oh, she couldn't wait to get rid of that, you know, when she could afford to buy a, re a replacement set of dishes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I would watch on Antique Roadshow this depression glass <laughs> going for hundreds of dollars, thinking, my mother threw it in the trash. Uh, so I think in terms of the Depression now, I think it's um, uh, anecdotal from t second or third hand. Um, I don't really have any tragic or happy or sad memories of it. it I guess I'm glad I missed it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move forward. How about high school? What memories do you have of that? Uh, I had a scholarship to Benedictine Academy in Elizabeth, and I have wonderful memories of that. Uh, took the 49 bus from Newark, and um, coincidentally, I uh, was grateful enough for the opportunity and, and happy enough with the experience that 25 years later, my daughter went to Benedictine Academy. And um, I'm happy to say that, like me, we've all survived the experience. It was a um, single-sex education, which in Elizabeth in those days was not unusual because the public schools also, they had Jeff for the boy, Jefferson High School for the boys and Batten for the girls. And um, I think that um, it's certainly a concept that I support uh, we wore uniforms, uh, uh, there was more than a little discipline and lots of unreasonable rules. But again, um, the concept that um, uh, women were uh, fit to be educated and educated very well and could go on and do uh, or try to do anything they wanted to was a concept that was fostered and um, uh, I think uh, had a very positive impact on me. Um, Ginny Long went to, uh, to Benedictine as well. Um, and they, um, they made sure there was a social life. Uh, we had the uh, boys from St. Benedict's Prep in Newark and Seton Hall uh, Prep in South Orange for little mixers and tea dances and we went to their ball games. I can't say that any of the young men ever came to our ball games, but uh, we managed the reverse. Um, I was fortunate. I had a good education, and I had uh, had the support to encourage you to try new things and do different things, and um, it worked. Now, I, I guess I get from what you say that the academy was very supportive about going on to higher education. Oh yes. What about your family? Was there some remnant of the old uh, sort of uh, European and Irish uh, thinking that uh, women's place was really in the home and that uh, you can educate uh, girls but only to a certain point? No, no, there was really none of that. Um, 
neither my mother nor your father had a college education, but it was uh, the, the typical immigrant story that the next generation um, uh, would would do better and have more opportunity, and, and that was clearly the case. Somewhere along the line, I discovered that one of the things they call first generation Irish is narrow back. And uh, the genesis of that is that uh, the first generation came over and built the canals and the railroad and the bridges and tunnels and all that kind of thing. Uh, ergo brought back heavy construction. And the next generation went to school and improved themselves, or hopefully would improve themselves, hence the derogatory term, I mean, it was not a friendly term, of, of narrow rack. Um, no, there was no question about that. There was support for that. Uh, um, as I say, my father wasn't quite sure about petticoat government, but he certainly was sure about education. And like, uh, like many who did not have the opportunity, um, he was self-educated in many ways when you talk about uh, current events or you talk about history or you talk about literature. Uh, he was a constant reader. Now you mentioned you received a scholarship to go to the academy. When it comes to, comes to the point of deciding about college, was money a significant factor? Well, I'm sure it was. I mean, speaking for myself, three, uh, you know, three kids later, uh, it, it is a factor, and yet you want, as a parent, um, to have the best opportunity you can. And, and um, I was fortunate, or my parents were fortunate, or we were all unfortunate in that I was an only child. And so um, I could pretty much and there wasn't, I mean, I was appalled when my own children were going to college, the competition and the anxiety. There wasn't that same kind of anxiety. It was pretty much if you could get your pennies together and uh, pass the application test, you could get in. I mean, it's not like it's the earth-shaking decision it is today. And um, so I don't think there was any question that I was going to go to college. And certainly Benedict and Foster did that because um, they all went on. If they did not go to college, uh, there were business schools. Uh, Drake and Gibbs were, were business schools and, of course, nursing. And so um, uh, the, the philosophy of Benedictine was that you had these four years in basic and that outfitted you to go innumerable directions, uh, whether it was business, whether it was nursing, whether it was uh, college education. There wasn't the county college system opportunity then that, that I think has become, uh, speaking of progress through the 70s, an absolutely wonderful uh, venue for young people. How did you come to make your own decision about where to attend uh, your higher education? Well, um, <laughs> it went all over the lot. I, uh, I uh, single sex, Catholic girls' school, and for some very pertinent reason at the time, uh, uh, Indiana University was on my list. And I, I can still remember getting the catalogs and thinking, they'll never find me, ever, ever find me. I mean, I had 51 uh, classmates graduate, and I'm looking at uh, uh, Indiana University, where there were uh, more than 51 people in, in any individual class, I think. Uh, so arranged from that, um, I finally decided I didn't want to go that far away. I, I uh, was fortunate in that I could go away, uh, but you know, I'd never been out of New Jersey, and uh, I wanted to break that home front, but I wanted to be able to get there if I had to. And so I pretty much limited myself to the, to the East Coast and uh, uh, Boston, St. Elizabeth's here in New Jersey. Um, oh, I can't even remember them all. But uh, uh, Trinity was in Washington, D.C. 
and that had uh, a particular lure for me, a fascination, I suppose. It was the roots of my caring about government. I don't know. But uh, uh, Trinity became, became the final absolute first choice. And uh, some of the others I followed up with applications. Some of them never got past the catalog stage. I can't even remember them all now. And so Trinity was. I kind of uh, uh, forced myself to admit what I was. Yeah. You know, a young woman uh, uh, from a very small high school and um, Catholic, practicing Catholic. And so uh, I guess I went for the comfort zone. Well, why was Washington such a draw to you? How did you develop that initial interest in government? Oh, Don, I have no idea. Uh, I'm a born sightseer, tourist, and been to Washington. Uh, I'm certainly a city person. Uh, all of the, uh, any of the places that were off the beaten track uh, were uh, dismissed almost out of hand. Uh, you know, Broad Market Street in Newark and the carbon monoxide had always had more appeal to me than, uh, uh, you know, the pine lands. Much as I didn't want to have them preserved, I didn't want to work or live or go to school there. Um, I sneeze and break out and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm a city person. I like buses. I haven't been on a bus in ages, but I like to know the bus is there. Uh, I like to be independent. I like to go to the theater. I, like, I mean, Washington has it all as far as a city is concerned. Um, interesting to note that uh, uh, of my children, I guess I've passed it on, two of them went to school in Philadelphia and one of them went to school in Washington. So we're all city people at heart. What were the courses that most interested you? I majored in history and government. I um, probably was um, better or, well, I take that back. I would say that uh, English probably came easier, but history was more of a challenge. Um, absolutely useless in languages, worse than useless in sciences and math. And um, ended up with history and, history and government. Now, as you near graduation, what are your thoughts about what comes next? When I neared graduation, a job. Um, I'm, you know, part of that era. Uh, you certainly didn't think in terms of career. Uh, you thought in terms of a job. Uh, I thought uh, I would like to stay in Washington. I took some courses at um, uh, George Washington University um, and at Seton Hall during summers so that um, although I did not have an economics major, I um, then had enough credits because I fancied the Department of Labor. I just felt there were a lot of opportunities in Washington. And in fact, worked in the, um, uh, the labor personnel section of the uh, Air Transport Association. Um, I guess it was my second job in Washington. But uh, working was definitely on my agenda. And what's the sort of next major step in your career and uh, lifetime chronology? Oh, uh, I got married and came back to New Jersey. That's, that's pretty, that was pretty big. <laughs> it was very big. How did you meet your husband? Well, uh, actually, he's from was from uh, this area. He. Uh, was born in St. Peter's Hospital here in New Brunswick. And uh, I met him in New Brunswick at a family party for um, one of my cousins, well, actually second cousins. Um, and Dan was just out of the army. You know, everyone, it was a compulsory draft in those days. And he'd served his two years in Japan and uh, was starting Georgetown Law School. 
and I was going into my senior year at Trinity, and uh, so that's how we met. And New Brunswick in those days was similar or different to today? Talk about New Brunswick when you uh, moved back. Well, it was considerably smaller and um, in, well, probably in difficult straits, although I didn't know it at the moment. I mean, everything was smaller. And this um, would have been what year approximately? Uh, let's see, that would have been around 58, 59, just prior to the 60s. Um, Rutgers was here, uh, as they are, have, they, have been, ever will be. Uh, but um, but a much different Rutgers at that point. Yeah, and uh, much smaller and much more insular. Um, there was not a lot of interaction uh, between the town and the um, university. Um, I think most of the people that I met from Rutgers, putting aside sports, that was a whole different question, um, thought that Rutgers was outside of Princeton or outside of New York. I mean, they'd cut their tongue out rather than say it was in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And, uh, you know, the town and gown had a wall that everybody threw bricks at, except for the teams. The town was very, very loyal to the teams at a time when the students weren't very loyal to the teams. I mean, I, you would meet more people from New Brunswick uh, at a Rutgers game than you would, uh, you know, in a city, or in then those days, city commission meeting. Um, what was the ethnic mix at that time? It was very ethnic. Um, the, it's the, uh, an Italian community, very strong Italian community, very strong um, Hungarian community, uh, a smaller or lessening, I guess, uh, German American community, uh, of course, an Irish. American community and um, a black or African American community um, that were well established and um, in many cases been here for you know several generations. Um, in in many of the ethnic families, uh, uh, the what had been the mom and pop was now the grandma and grandpa, or the great grandma and great grandpa, and they were still here. And the, the children had gone elsewhere for other opportunities. So it was an aging population, it was an aging city. And, um, uh, but it was still very much a community neighborhood, kind of, even the churches. Uh, uh, I mean, I'd never been to a place where uh, uh, every group had its own religious house of worship, and um, very, very insular in that regard. Um, so it was a small town and an old town. Now, you give up your job to move back to New Jersey, I assume, your job yes, in did. Washington. Uh, did you think immediately about looking for another job? Like oh yeah, I was working at the Educational Testing Service mm -hmm. and uh, took the bus uh, from New Brunswick to Princeton. I was in the research department of ETS. Had a very interesting time of it. It was a fun job. Mm -hmm. How long did that last? Oh, probably not more than a year. I left when I had my first child. Mm -hmm. And when you give birth, do you think possibly that's the end of your uh, career outside the home, that you would rather be a stay-at-home mom, or was that not something that you really thought about? Well, certainly um, when the children were very little, uh, I did not think about that one way or the other. I don't think it was a conscious decision. 
um, until I was widowed. And then it turned out that education at Benedictine and Trinity uh, was a little more vital for me than perhaps some of my classmates. And, um, you know, I had to raise three children. And talk about that and the choices and the personal sort of conflict that that must have brought. Well, it wasn't a personal conflict. It was a difficult time. I was fortunate in having a, a strong family support. Uh, but I was a widow, a young widow with three children. So, I mean, you can't say it was conflict. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. Mm -hmm. And how did you handle that financially? Well, uh, my husband was a member of a law firm, and uh, uh, the law firm was, was generous in terms of a settlement um, so that um, I could stay home until, uh, uh, you know, the children were, well, at least the youngest, was ready for school. So I had some income coming in, and uh, uh, Social Security. It, it's not only old people, it's uh, uh, widows and orphans that uh, benefit from Social Security. But the only thing they don't benefit from is the IRS. They don't care about widows and orphans. <laughs> I don't think they care about anybody, but uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, I had a lot of support. Okay. And uh, you're getting, I guess, more involved in New Brunswick and your neighborhood. And uh, talk about sort of the activities that you had as a, as a single mother in, the, in community activities. Well, I don't think they differ much from anyone else. Uh, it was the PTA and there was the church and uh, um, the women's club, or happy to say junior women's club. Um, Lone Association, uh, Hospital Auxiliary, uh, uh, all the things that uh, uh, in a society where uh, women are not generally in the workplace, which is very different from today, um, I was in the clubs and organizations uh, that were committed to uh, improving our lifestyle or our community or, or, or um, surroundings, whatever. What were the politics of New Brunswick at that time? Well, it was a commission form of government, just like Newark, Walsh Act, 1912 community. Uh, there were five commissioners. Uh, they were all men. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, the year before my husband died, he was appointed to uh, the city commission in New Brunswick. What year would that be? That would have been 1960. And um, that was very much the system, as you will often see it today. You appoint someone uh, to a vacancy so they can run as an incumbent. I think you've heard that a few times, a few places. And um, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the 1960s, New Brunswick and other cities in New Jersey began to, toward the end of the decade at least, uh, suffer some urban unrest and riots in some of the uh, larger cities. Did you see that coming, or was it sort of a, was it a surprise to you? Well. By the time that began to uh, actually percolate up, um, I ran for office myself. And uh, we were a slate, again, still the city commission. So there were five of us. We called ourselves the new five. They called themselves the old, uh, the good five. We called them the old five. And um, so we were elected in um, May of 1967, which when you mention social unrest, you will recognize that uh, 
that summer was a very difficult one, particularly in Newark, which led the way. So we had a difficult time. Um, I don't know that we knew enough to see it coming, if you will. We had, uh, we had several advantages on our side uh, in that um, we had no outside agitation, either from the New York media, who called every hour of the day and night to know about the bloodshed and the guns, or in fact staged it as they did in Plainfield. So we had no outside agitation in that regard. We didn't have busloads of people coming from anywhere. Um, the situation in New Brunswick was our very own homegrown situation. Um, they were our kids that were acting up on the streets. And uh, we were able, I think, because we were new and despite uh, difficulty, um, we were able to make some, some inroads and, and create some peace and some oasis. Again, not alone. The clergy, I mentioned earlier how uh, many uh, there were and how many different uh, backgrounds they were, they came together and they were unbelievable in terms of support and assistance. Um, the families, particularly the, the African-American community, many of those families had been here for two or three, four generations. So there was a stable middle-class black community, which I don't think existed in, in some other places, perhaps. And that was a help. And um, things were in terrible shape. But it was not only the minorities or the um, unrepresented um, citizens of the community that were impacted. You all were. You know, unless you were a white middle-aged male that went to the Elks Club on Thursday afternoon, you had no say in what happened in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And so I think we had the opportunity uh, in a very difficult situation to uh, ask for and to receive assistance from all segments of the community because uh, they couldn't blame us for what had gone before and maybe they'd have a part of making things better. To backtrack a bit, do you think your involvement in politics and in electoral politics was first generated by your husband's interest or was it something that you had held at least in the back of your mind for many years, particularly your sort of attraction to Washington and going to college there and being so close to the government and the government agencies in your early career? Well, no. I think, I think I'd have to say it's probably um, the death of my husband more than anything else because, um, you know, like any other young couple, um, newly formed young couple, um, we could have settled and done and gone most anywhere. Uh, you know, we could have stayed in Washington. We both knew, had gone to school in Washington. We could have uh, gone to New York. Uh, he did graduate work at NYU, he got his um, SJDM day, whatever the advanced degree is after the LLB, uh, from NYU, and we loved going into New York. Uh, so we could have gone anywhere, and um, it was really um, his choice uh, that that anywhere be New Brunswick, New Jersey. And, um, in some ways, I took it as a personal affront and, and, you know, here we are, three kids, and now he's gone and I'm stuck with New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, but also, New Brunswick, New Jersey was stuck with me and I had a sense that uh, if this is where he wanted to raise his children, well, I had an obligation to 
at least try to help to make a contribution to make it a good and better place uh, to settle. So uh, I suppose that would be the instigation. It certainly had an impact on my willingness to run. And it's, it's easier to run when you have no concept of the fact that you might win. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly didn't think that there was any opportunity, any chance in your wildest dreams that uh, the electorate in New Brunswick would vote for a woman. Mm -hmm. Who were your mentors politically at that time? Well, uh, George Sammy, who was my uh, husband's law partner, or one of my husband's law partners, was very much involved and, in fact, uh, uh, put the slate together. Um, I think that uh, he was probably more influential than anyone in, in getting me to run um, on the theory that I could add something to the slate. Uh, my husband was well known and loved, and uh, there were still people that remembered him. Um, I have often said, you know, have mouth will travel, so I was not afraid of, of speaking my mind. And um, I thought if I could add something to the uh, slate in terms of bringing people out, getting people involved who perhaps had not been involved in government before, that was all to the plus if we wanted to effect real change. And uh, then I could go back home and raise my kids because I'd never get elected. Talk about that first campaign. What was it like? What did you learn? What did you do well? What did you do badly? Oh, it seems like such ancient history now. Um, I think the, the thing that we did the best was talk to the people. I mean, we went door to door every night, and we talked to people. And it was certainly the hardest thing I did. I never rang a doorbell that my stomach didn't give a lurch. And I was never, ever abused or mistreated in any way. I was always greeted. Uh, with uh, politeness and uh, sometimes enthusiasm, uh, but sometimes not. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, I think part of this whole television world that we live in is uh, sad and unfortunate because I don't think, I think candidates get caught up in that now and they don't talk to real people and hear about real problems and um, think about real concerns um, when it's in your face, uh, what do they call it, retail politics. Um, uh, what did Tip O'Neill say, uh, all politics is neighborhood politics or something to that effect. Uh, so I think that's a good experience and it certainly was the thing that we did best. Uh, we were not remote, we weren't arrogant, and we really wanted to um, provide some public service to the citizens of the community where we were all uh, committed to staying, raising, we were all young, we all had young families, and New Brunswick was, was very much on our minds. Uh, we weren't, you know, we weren't moving to the suburbs, uh, we weren't... Uh, moving back to Washington uh, or Philadelphia or wherever. And um, New Brunswick has all kinds of added attributes that are positive. Um, what it didn't have was a, um, an obligation or a sense of commitment uh, from anybody else but New Brunswick. I mean, let the cities, you know, Burn. That uh, really was an attitude of far too many people. Uh, I mean, 60% of the land area was tax exempt. 80% um, of the uh, children in public housing were under 15. 25% uh, of the uh, taxpayer homeowners were over 65. I mean, there were 
a lot of institutional problems that were um, that needed to be addressed and needed to have other layers of government provide assistance. It wasn't, you know, just an old boys club puttering along. Mm -hmm. I've got mine and the heck with everybody else. So who, it was an interesting was, campaign. Who were the powers in the political establishment in New Brunswick and Middlesex County at the time? Well, General Willens was uh, by far the, the uh, county leader. David Willens. David Willens. David T. Willens. And um, I think what is interesting, and I'm not sure I knew it at the time, I certainly knew it later, uh, was that he provided a great deal of assistance by staying out of it. Um, I think that, um, um, you know, if he had supported the incumbent team to any degree, um, we would have had a more difficult time than we did. And uh, he, he just did not become involved at all, nor did his organization. It was a um, Walsh Act community, so the elections were in May, theoretically nonpartisan, uh, although New Brunswick is very much a democratic town. Um, George Outlowski was on the Board of Freeholders, and uh, everybody stood back and watch the, funny to think of me as a young Turk, but watch the young, the young folks take on the old folks. And uh, I think, as I say, it was a tacit admission of support, uh, although I don't think anybody would ever have admitted that. Do you have any speculation as to why the organization people did sit on the sidelines? Was it dissatisfaction with the incumbents? Well, that would be my guess, because from my perspective, or our perspective, um, nobody was satisfied with the incumbents. I mean, they'd been in office, um, not all of them, but certainly that organization, if you could call it an organization, for 27 years. And so uh, um, they had two public meetings a month at 10 o'clock on a weekday morning. So even if you had an issue, a problem, a concern, even a congratulatory note, uh, you had no way if you were working or caring for a family or surviving uh, that you could get to it. So it, was, it wasn't providing even the basic services anymore. The garbage didn't get picked up. The snow didn't get removed. Um, it was like it had been abandoned. How much of a factor was the civil unrest at the time? Was it that held against the incumbent administration that they hadn't sort of kept the peace? No, because uh, my sense of timing as it is, is I really came in time to have that four watch. square. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I mean, it was a fault of theirs to the extent that, uh, like every other community, uh, they weren't ready for it. I mean, um, there was no such thing as um, police training. There was no such thing as modern equipment. Uh, I mean, when, when things became difficult, I think there were something like four or six less than a dozen anyway, walkie-talkies in the whole police department, and half of them didn't have batteries. Uh, um, one uh, member of the department, one member of the whole department was the only one that had ever been to FBI school. Um, you know, so they didn't have the, the tools and the equipment. Um, you know, Snowplow was 37 years old. They didn't have the tools or the equipment to provide the service that citizens have a right to, much less a willingness to provide it. And to your surprise, you do get elected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are people in this town that are still surprised. Come on, it's 30 years later. Uh, 
how did you sort of juggle your family responsibilities in the new public role? Well, um, they were all in school at that point, which uh, was very important. And I had a, um, it was before daycare. Don't I often think of that when I see the, the opportunities for young mothers now, or young children as well. But um, I had a cadre of uh, loyal, wonderful babysitters. Um, went through several families where there were uh, multiple uh, young women in the family, and I worked my way through all of them. I had uh, family support in case of an emergency. My parents were in Newark, Dan's parents were in Highland Park. Um, and um, I think that's how we muddled through. It wasn't easy, but um, I always been involved in meetings of one kind or another. I now uh, found they were government meetings. And what were your specific responsibilities in government? I was the uh, mayor, so I had all the honorary things in terms of cutting ribbons and, and speaking for the community. Um, I had the uh, planning department, let's see, we had a department of public safety and that was one commissioner. Uh, public works was another commissioner. Um, I had the I had the planning board, I had the library, I had the board of adjustment, a lot of appointments to make, and um, speak for the town in terms of negotiating with various groups within the community. Um, establish the first ecumenical prayer service ever in the community. Um, had the first Citizens Recreation Committee. I mean, had the first cleanup in the garbage, uh, you know, garbage day cleanup. I mean, little kinds of things. Um, the first inner office memo. They didn't write things down. Had the Chamber of Commerce come in and do a, uh, almost a time and motion study discovered to buy a po box of pencils as the mayor in New Brunswick in, uh, in the 1960s. Somebody handled a piece of paper 12 times. What were the factors, Ridiculous. particularly as uh, a woman in times when women were relatively rare in elective office, that you got selected to run for mayor uh, as opposed to another member of your re reform team? Well, um, the person that was serving as mayor when we ran had not been first in terms of the election uh, on that particular slate of five people. So that became a rallying cry uh, for our insurgent group, if you will. He who gets the most votes should be the mayor. That's an indication of public support. And um, as a matter of fact, I was called on it at one of the debates. We had innumerable debates. You had four people together, we would come. Uh, and so, what do you mean, he? And I said, oh, well, he or she, and laughed. And I, in fact, did get the most votes. And we carried through on campaign promise number one, and uh, I was mayor. At that time, do you recall how many other women were mayors in New Jersey? Practically none. Um, Seal Norton was the mayor of Seabright, and Catherine Elkis White had been the mayor of Red Bank. And we were a little bit of a trio team at uh, various democratic functions and, and so on. Um, I really had a much stronger relationship and uh, uh, I'm happy to say it didn't have a gender reflection with the mayors of the cities. Uh, Tom Dunn and Art Holland and um, 
Ken Gibson. I mean, uh, although I was a smaller city, we spoke the same language. We were facing the same kinds of problems. Uh, we had the same um, suburban fantasy. Uh, Mr. Blanding's builds his dream house attitude to uh, work against. We had the uh, populations most in need. I mean, if any place in, when they came out of the county jail after a term, no matter where they had originally come from, those inmates were brought to the welfare office in New Brunswick or in Newark or in Jersey City. And uh, so, I mean, everybody was dumping on the cities. And uh, so, uh, uh, as I say, I think I established a, a fine working relationship with Paul Jordan in, in, in Jersey City. And, um, well, I don't have to repeat the point. And talk about your memories of some of those mayors that you, you just mentioned, what their personalities were like, how they were similar or different in the way they ran their cities. Well, I think, I think we were a besieged group, besieged on all sides, and um, a federal government had pretty much turned against the cities. And uh, I'm proud of my association with them and am working with them. Uh, I found them all to be dedicated. Um, I mean, some of us were, were not as smart as others. Some were smarter than others. Uh, but I don't think any of them, uh, I mean, it, it was a privilege to me. They were dedicated to their community, and more particularly, they were dedicated, truly dedicated, uh, to making things better for their people. There was a sense of their people. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all. And um, they were... Uh, or tried to be statesmen and stateswoman mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with a sense of beating on the legislature's door to be heard from, to be responded to, to tweak things so that we weren't undone. And um, I think, uh, by and large, uh, w we were effective. We had, um, we had friends on both sides of the aisle and uh, the mayors were on both sides of the aisle. Some were independent, primarily they were democratic. Um, and some of them had, um, you know, unfortunate ends in terms of perhaps getting off the track. But when they served as mayor, uh, they truly served their cities. I'm very proud of them. Mm. I'm proud to be part of that group. And at some point, uh, you also become outside your public role, employed by New Brunswick's uh, most famous private employer, Johnson & Johnson. Talk about how that came about. I worked at Johnson & Johnson prior to being in public office. I um, uh, worked for them once my children started school. And uh, I'm proud of that association as well. I mean, I don't think... Uh, any corporation is, uh, is perfect, but I think one of the outstanding hallmarks of uh, Johnson & Johnson is that they want to be right. There was never, ever any sense of, uh, you know, get the job done, but don't tell me the details. There was never any sense of, uh, you know, uh, our public, we're saying this in public, but we're really doing this on the sly, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm proud of that association. It certainly was important to me. What were your various positions at JNJ? &J? Uh, I started out in human resources and um, did uh, wage and salary surveys, job evaluations, um, college hiring rates, the kinds of things that um, were in the personnel department of those days. And uh, as I say now, they call human resources. Mm -hmm.
Well, you got to get with it. Everything changes. <laughs> Sometimes the more it stays, it changes the more it stays the same. But it, it was in the personnel field, and that's what I had worked in with the Air Transport Association as well. So I'd had some experience in that. In your sort of public role, did you find it uh, helpful or a problem to have this employment with uh, J and J? J&J is so large that I assume that their municipal issues are somewhat incidental to their overall operations, but was it something that became a political liability to you uh, when you uh, were up for election? No, I think, uh, I'm sure you've heard as um, it's been said over and over and, and oftentimes different ways. But nonetheless, the, the, the hallmark of, of uh, Johnson & Johnson is what they call the credo. And one of the uh, main tenants after children and nurses and doctors uh, is the community. Uh, where uh, they're located with a facility or where their employees live, um, uh, you know, which suggests the surrounding area to a particular facility. So they have a long history of corporate citizenship, and um, they were uh, uh, certainly generous with their time um, in terms of allowing me time. Uh, I would like to think and hope that perhaps they were proud of me. Um, but there was uh, no sense of conflict. There was no sense of... Um, well, now you're the mayor, and, and we're your um, paycheck every month, because uh, the mayor is the only 24-hour-a-day part-time job around, although not all of them are part-time anymore, uh, at least in terms of uh, remuneration. But no, there, w there wasn't a conflict. Um, there were certainly times when we didn't agree with each other, we being the city administration and the Johnson & Johnson. Um, but by and large, they're pretty good corporate citizens. I don't think there's a place in the world that wouldn't be happy to have a J&J &J facility. It's part of their uh, tax base. Um, they weren't our largest landowner. Uh, their land was really minuscule when you think about the land that the hospitals and this university took up and off the tax rolls. Um, they were a significant employer, but again, not even the largest employer. Uh, the two hospitals uh, uh, did more than that, aside from the government. But um, they, were, they were a player in the program. But I'm not sure that they, they played any differently in New Brunswick than they did anywhere else because I was mayor, either for me or against me. As mayor, I assume you start to get drawn into county and statewide politics and personalities. You've already mentioned David Willens, the longtime Middlesex County Democratic leader and former attorney general, prosecutor in the Lindbergh kidnapping case, a very famous uh, person in New Jersey history. Did you have much personal contact with him? I didn't have much contact with him. I had much more contact with um, Governor Hughes and with uh, members of the legislature. Um, fortunately for me, as a new mayor in particular, um, Governor Hughes had established the Department of Community Affairs just really prior to my coming. And uh, so Paul Ibbesacker was the first commissioner. And as any first commissioner, or any commissioner for that matter, uh, you want to make a little bit of a record and have some success. Uh, and uh, here was this new mayor just up the road a piece who wanted to do a job and had no resources. And Paul had all kinds of resources. And so it was a very happy marriage in terms of uh, intergovernmental relations. And, uh, you know, I, I mined that field for every nickel I could get. And um, 
as I said, Governor Hughes, uh, I'm happy to know personally, and he was very supportive, as was uh, his family. And um, so I became involved in state politics, uh, but primarily at the state level, uh, with, as I say, the legislature and with the governor. Uh, and that being said, it seemed, in retrospect, I don't think I was smart enough to know it at the time, that um, the um, hands-off, if you will, of uh, General Willens was in fact an endorsement or at least a, a tacit support because I think perhaps he could have cut us off at the knees and instead uh, welcomed us gracefully. I mean, we had, this was an outstanding accomplishment uh, for us to win, you know, total neophytes, to win over an administration that had been in for 27 years. And um, we had a victory dinner to end all victory dinners representing all people. I think the tickets were, just to put it in perspective with 2006, I think they were $10. Uh, at the Greenbrier, which you may remember was the political place to have events, or the only place big enough to have events. In any case, both General Willens and Dick Hughes were there. And um, the general said several times in later years, it was the only time it was ever at a dinner where anybody made the governor wait till one o'clock in the morning to get to the microphone. But uh, we had a lot of other more important voters <laughs> to have a chance to say something. What more memories do you have of Governor Hughes? Oh, Governor Hughes was fantastic. Uh, when um, uh, he was leaving office and Governor Cahill was coming in, uh, the cities were still in a difficult time. And he called me down to Morven to meet Bill Cahill, uh, more to the point for Bill Cahill to meet me, and understand that um, New Brunswick, home of Rutgers, home of J&J, uh, was a, um, an important place in New Jersey and that um, he wanted to be sure that Bill knew that uh, if I needed help that the governor's office would provide it. And that's certainly a memory that's going to uh, go on and on and on because, as I say, uh, Governor Hughes was never further than a telephone call away in all our most difficult time. Let's take a short break. Pat, before our uh, break, we talked about your election as mayor in your first term. Uh, you then uh, stand for re-election. What had changed in the time before your first election and the second time you ran? Well, the, I guess the most critical thing is we changed the form of government uh, from the Walsh Act commission form of government where, as you may recall, each of the five elected uh, commissioners have a specific department and both administrative and legislative uh, impact, five independent fiefdoms, if you will. And uh, so the form of government was changed to a mayor and strong council, um, or a strong mayor and council got it backwards. Um, and so when we ran the for re-election, we had to run, I had to run individually as mayor. There was no hiding behind this, like getting mixed up in among the five somewhere. And so, uh, and it was an important hurdle for me um, to see that it could be done, that it was for real, that uh, uh, they did intend to have Patchy and represent them, and so uh, uh, that was the, the biggest difference. The other difference is that uh, we tried to show um, that we had, in fact, made changes. Uh, we hadn't correct in place everything. We hadn't constructed the Garden of Eden or anything like that, but, but things were better 
people were more involved, uh, citizens could be heard at City Hall. We had a meeting at night as well as a meeting in the morning, and uh, we had uh, involved more citizens from various areas than had ever been done in the city. And so it, it was a vindication of all our efforts, and we put in a lot of hard work, and we were endorsed and reelected. So it was a coup for us. And in your second term, uh, you dealt for most, if not all, of that term with the Cahill administration, a Republican administration. How did that differ in terms of the relationship between the municipalities and the state government? Well, I think overall it was um, more difficult. Not. Uh, not through uh, Bill Cahill's doing, because uh, I think at heart he was an urban person as well and was very good to the cities. But um, uh, one of the basic differences, I think, between the two parties is that um, the Republican base was, was in the suburbs and the needs of suburban New Jersey were paramount. Um, whereas the Democrats' base of support was in the cities and they were more willing to respond to those needs. Um, personally, for, for myself and for New Brunswick, uh, um, I can't say enough about the support that we got from Bill Cahill. Uh, Governor Hughes, before he left office, made sure that uh, I met and had some time with the governor the incoming governor, Bill Cahill, and that um, uh, we were doing or trying to do good things in New Brunswick and uh, he should help us all he can, and he did. And of course the Cahill administration initiated some of the things that later in your career became significant, such as the Meadowlands uh, plan and the uh, initial concept uh, for the Meadowlands. But the Cahill administration did run into political problems uh, which jeopardized and ultimately uh, defeated his uh, uh, attempt at re-election. Uh, what were your thoughts as you sort of s saw the troubles besetting the Cale administration? Well, I think that for me personally, and I don't pretend to be any astute political analyst, but I think that if, um, I think Bill Cahill was beaten in the primary uh, by fellow Republicans, and um, there's there's a question. Uh, certainly, I'm I'm sure it's crossed Brendan's mind as well as others that had Bill Cahill not been defeated in the primary, he might well have won a second term, and Brendan would not have had an opportunity to be governor. Mm -hmm. I think that you know it's the classic shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. Well, as the uh, election in 1973 uh, starts to heat up, uh, at least a few candidates get in early in the race. Brendan Byrne is a relatively late comer to enter the primary race. Uh, what were the politics of Middlesex County in terms of the gubernatorial primary in 1973? Well. As far as I can remember, and uh, I'm victim of senior memory moments more than most, I suppose, but um, Ed Crabiel was a senator from uh, Middlesex, and um, that was at a time where uh, being a senator, senatorial districts, it was before the one man, one vote, so there was much more identity. Uh, in our county, and I'm sure in others, um, with your legislators, and um, we supported our our own uh, Ed Crabill. How did that message get percolated? Was it just understood that he was a Middlesex County person, he was the senator, and we all get in line, or is it something more direct that the county chairman, uh, either directly or through surrogates, says do this or else? Well, it's probably a combination of all of them, and I can't, 
I can't put myself in a position to to tell you what what happened, where or when. But speaking as uh, an elected official, speaking as someone who was involved in in uh, democratic politics, someone who's an arch Democrat all her life, um, I can say that. Um, you know, if you have a candidate that you know, personally respect and believe in, and he represents your turf and is running for another office, it's almost automatic that you would want to support him. And uh, um, I think Ed Crabill was an outstanding legislator. I think he served the citizens of uh, Middlesex very well and went on to serve uh, in the Byrne administration. So um, while there may have been pressure from somebody on somebody, I certainly wasn't aware of it. I think it, it came out of the commitment to the Democratic Party. And um, I'm not saying that I would support a candidate just because he or she was a Democrat. But I am saying that if there was a candidate that was a Democrat from my neighborhood, uh, that's where my affiliation would uh, would be. Um, so I think that's pretty automatic. Well, in fact, uh, late in the uh, uh, process, uh, before, right, right before the filing deadline for the primary, uh, Brendan Byrne, then a sitting judge, resigns from the bench and enters the race. What was your first uh, contact or experience with him as a candidate? Well, it was at a mayor's meeting in Princeton at the university there, and um, it was, I guess, meet the candidates night, or meet the candidates afternoon. I, I can't really remember in detail, but he was, and I'm not sure as I think about it, that all, there were a number of candidates, maybe seven, uh, and I'm not sure that all seven of them were there, but certainly a majority of the candidates were there. And uh, they each spoke individually, and then there was a question and answer, answer period. And as you say, um, Brendan was really brand new to the campaign uh, at about that same time. I'm fairly sure that that was one of his first public um, meet critical organizations uh, opportunities. How was he as a speaker or as a candidate? He was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would think, I don't know, but I would think that uh, coming off the bench, he was not used to uh, uh, speaking. I don't know. I shouldn't even say that. But my guess is when you speak from the and I, I don't have a law background, but when you speak from the bench, everybody listens. I know that from my various stints as a, as a jury, juror. Um, and when you're one of five or six candidates seeking support, it's a whole different thing. And uh, as I say, uh, he became seasoned very quickly. But that was not a good experience. I, I don't think I've ever asked him what he thought about it, but I imagine he thinks the same. It was a baptism, and, and he went on to clearly be prepared and able to get his message across. Did you have any other contacts with him after that first uh, session at the mayor's meeting? Not really, uh, except to the extent that after the primary, uh, when the candidates were chosen by both parties, uh, I worked my tail off as a Democrat for the Democratic ticket. But it was, you know, not a one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know that Brendan knew I was working, and um, I certainly had no real contact with him, except at those uh, events, um, you know, the Middlesex County Democratic soiree or uh, the railroad station in downtown New Brunswick. I mean, if our candidate was in my town, I was there. So I contributed some little bits of support. Mm. 
Did you see much improvement in his campaigning performance? Uh, Oh well, yeah, he had only election campaign. Oh, absolutely. He had only one place to go, and that was <laughs> up, and he he went up very well. And of course, he uh, his opponent, surprisingly, was Congressman Sandman, who had defeated uh, Governor Cahill uh, in the uh, Republican primary. Did you feel that it was pretty much a lock that Brendan Murray would be elected governor, given that Congressman Sandman was such a was viewed as such a, a representative of the of the right wing of the Republican Party. Well, I'm of the school of thought it's never over till it's over, and until the votes are counted, I'm never sure of anything. Um, but clearly, as I said earlier, uh, I think the Republicans shot themselves in the foot. Uh, Sandman was a terrible candidate, and certainly had no. Uh, was no threat to Brendan in New Brunswick, New Jersey, that's for sure, or in Middlesex County, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, um, there was no question, I mean, uh, there was no question that we were supporting him, and um, I think that uh, Ed Crabiel was a factor in that support as a candidate that lost. Hey, I ran for the primary. I lost. Now we all get behind the win winning candidate, and um, I think that that was a, an important influence on us all. I mean, he didn't go home and lick his wounds and say, "Oh, you know, you beat me, so I'm not going to help you." That wasn't part of it. That's not the democratic way. Mm -hmm. uh, on issues, uh, Congressman Sandman was fervently an anti-tax uh, candidate. Governor Byrne famously uh, fudged uh, the tax issue by saying he didn't see the need for an income tax, quote, in the foreseeable future, close quote. Uh, in retrospect, given Brendan Byrne's large lead over Congressman Sandman, would it have been better for him in that general election campaign to be a little more forthright on the need for a broad-based tax in New Jersey? Would that have helped him avoid some of the political problems later that uh, impugned his credibility and his honesty? I don't take any of that very seriously. I mean, there's nobody running for office that's going to say they're for taxes. And even if there were some out there after uh, uh, the debacle of, of Jim Florio uh, with the tax issue, uh, you're not going to find anybody at all, even in, in little pockets. I mean, it's a fact of life that there are taxes, and it's a fact of life that they only go up. Um, so I think his fudging, as you call it, was, was rather astute. <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is that we all worked very hard for the income tax. And I think all of us are disappointed that, um, uh, as we worked hard for the lottery, uh, that um, despite those efforts and despite the imposition of those taxes, that um, we still haven't solved the, the property tax problem in New Jersey, uh, which is unconscionable. And uh, the, it's particularly unconscionable as we speak now because governments at a standstill, uh, which no one can justify. Uh, so I think that uh, being honest and forthright with the people, I mean, I think Governor Corzine has been very clear on this. Um, what we have isn't going to work, and we've got to somehow, unlike the current federal government, not continuously burden our children and our grandchildren with today's problems. Governor, Governor Byrne gets elected uh, in November 1973. Uh, you're now in the third year, I b believe, of your second term as mayor. Yeah, my, my second term would have ended on December of 74. Uh, so I, I guess there's consideration as to what you might do next, as I understand it, uh, although there wasn't a term limit in New Brunswick, it's sort of an informal understanding, and 
you would pledge that you would only serve two terms, or was it something uh, somewhat softer than that? It was a lot softer than that. Uh, I felt re-election was very important uh, to justify and ratify my serving at all. Uh, I felt that re-election was important for that. But because the uh, administration that we defeated had been in for so long, uh, I had the sense, at least personally, just speaking for myself, that um, they began to feel that the office was theirs as opposed to the office being a place to serve the, the citizens. And so um, I had resolved, in my own mind at least, that I would not run again for a third term uh, to widen the divide and emphasize the contrast between the new administration and the administration that, that we had defeated. Uh, I thought it was important for people to recognize that uh, um, the mayor served the people. It wasn't that the people served the mayor. As I say, that was a personal idiosyncrasy with me. At some point during the uh, transition period, uh, as the Byrne administration prepares to take office, uh, your name comes up as a potential member of the administration. <laughs> How did that come about? Well, I'm not sure, uh, to be honest, how it all came about. I can only speak for myself. Um, and as I indicated earlier, uh, the city of New Brunswick and the office of mayor and Pat Sheehan, in more or less that order, uh, had uh, uh, forged a very close relationship with the Department of Community Affairs. And the mission of the Department of Community Affairs coincided with what I saw as my mission as mayor of New Brunswick. Um, and so uh, I thought it was a perfect fit. And uh, it was uh, an office that I uh, very much wanted to have. And um, Senator Ed Craviel and uh, Assemblyman Bob Willens um, were both very much in my corner. Um, whether they initiated it or my efforts with them caused them to initiate it or whether it came from some other direction, I really don't know. Yeah. Um, but I wanted it very badly. I felt I had the experience and the resume to support it. Uh, I certainly knew the mayors. I didn't quite know all then 567, but I, I knew them throughout the state from various committees and organizations that I represented or been on, and um, it was a job I wanted, and Brendan saw that I got it. Who were your key contacts within the Byrne team that you spoke with and were interviewed by? Other than the governor and um, uh, Jerry English and Ed Craviel, who was very much a part of that team. In fact, I think he was already Secretary of State by the time uh, we got to Department of Community <laughs> Affairs. Uh, those were certainly the key people. And you didn't deal with Dick Leone at that point? Or? Mm -mm, no, not till later. And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, now, when did you uh, hear that you actually were going to be nominated, and by whom? Was that the governor himself? I would imagine, I don't know, I'd be only making it up if I said, I was uh, nominated in February and uh, sworn in at the mid, midpoint in February of 74. Do you recall what the governor told you his idea of your job was? Well. Knowing the way I babble, I probably had uh, more to say uh, than he did, but my sense of it is that um, I got all kinds of encouragement from him to uh, provide service to the cities in particular 
and in truth to all the communities, but particularly to the cities, and also to serve as their voice at the table, because um, if the cities and the towns of New Jersey didn't have me at the table in terms of the cabinet, they didn't have anybody because the mission of each of the other departments was um, much more defined and much more established because the Department of Community Affairs hadn't been around that long to be um, rigidly uh, boxed in as to what it could do and not do. And at that point, there was still uh, the vestiges of uh, many of the federal programs, um, the Great Society, Action, and so on, uh, which meant that there would be a resource. So we're back to have mouth will travel, and um, he seemed to be pleased with that. As you took over the administrative control of the department, what did you see as the main goals you wanted to accomplish and the main problems you were facing at that time? Well, I think as um, any new commissioner, um, you had problems in terms of knowing exactly what the responsibilities and the, the opportunities as well as the roadblocks are within a department, uh, meeting the people. Um, I mean, there was no wholesale, everybody out on the street, start new. Um, discovering where the strengths and the weaknesses were. Uh, by and large, in my experience at least, in state government is that um, it's made up of uh, really dedicated smart, able, hardworking people who get burned out very quickly because the system of, of government is so rigid that it works against decision making, it works against um, innovation, it works against um, working hard. I mean, my department, like every other department, uh, had young people, old people, uh, people at various levels of civil service, and they all got treated the same. And uh, so sometimes your enthusiasm for work gets beat down if you look, and all around you are people who are making more money and working less time and so on. So I think that the system of government works against, and we have much better and more dedicated employees with the government than we deserve to have. And by the same token, having that said, been said, if there are bad apples, you have to work around them because you, there's no way that uh, uh, the inefficient, ineffective, um, dishonest person um, is removed. So it's a difficult system. I mean, I think any of us that have come against tenure or civil service or whatever uh, understand that um, protecting employees from the, the crazy notions of, of a commissioner is important, but it also prevents innovation and, and so on. So I felt I had the best department there was. Uh, probably because it was the newest and things weren't all engraved in stone. And uh, it, it's a constant battle to uh, get things done. And I think a commissioner has to support uh, the directors and the employees and know who they are and share their vision. And I think it worked very well. Now, even before Governor Byrne was sworn in, he was drawn into the controversy over the financing of Giant Stadium in the Meadowlands, which at that time was viewed as a linchpin for the overall development scheme. 
uh, there was an attempt by New York to sort of undermine the uh, financing. Uh, I know that some of this happened even before you took office as commissioner, but uh, what was your memories of that or your perspective uh, uh, in terms of the fight over the Meadowlands? Well, it's come to mind uh, recently in a number of different ways uh, with the mega mergers that we're seeing uh, so that I'm not sure we were talking about that just recently I'm not sure that in 2006 that could have been pulled off mm -hmm. because it was the uh, the banks the banking institutions in New Jersey that saved the day and um, we don't have that anymore. It's the same way with the housing bond issue uh, that w came a little bit later in my, my term as a commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs. Uh, I mean, I spoke to this room, the silence would have been deafening. And it wasn't until Tom Stanton from First Jersey stood up and said, I'll take 10 million that the dam burst and we had a housing bond issue in New Jersey. I can't emphasize how important that was in terms of making things work and providing safe, clean, sanitary, decent places for people to live. And um, the same was true earlier at the time you speak with the um, whole concept of the Meadowlands and the stadium. And um, it was very important that those financial institutions felt and believed and knew that uh, New Jersey's well-being was important to them, making money was important, saving or serving the citizens of New Jersey was important. And I'm not so sure if you were in a white tower in uh, North Carolina that you would have the same impetus to take the risk, and it was a risk. Now, housing became a very large issue in the Byrne administration, partly because of the New Jersey Supreme Court's decision in the Mount Laurel series of cases. Uh, as an ex-urban mayor, how did you uh, react to the Mount Laurel uh, litigation and the S Supreme Court's decisions? Well, I was much more down in the trenches. Uh, as Commissioner of Community Affairs, I was also Chairman of the, what was then the Housing Finance Agency, New Jersey, FHA, and uh, also the Mortgage Finance Agency. I was not Chairman of that, I was a member. And uh, our mission was to get housing built. And uh, Mount Laurel really was Although that was a key issue statewide, uh, for us it was kind of auxiliary. It was going to uh, make it possible to have, we thought or were told, um, to have a balance of housing in, in New Jersey. I mean, back to my days as, as mayor, there were several mayors in discussions one time or another who said, uh, you know, crying about the uh, property tax, um, that their children, their policemen, their teachers couldn't afford to live in their towns. There was no, no available housing for someone of a new couple starting out, or as I say, a policeman, a fireman, um, teachers couldn't afford to live in, in many of our towns back in the 70s. So you know how much worse it is now. So our, our business was to find groups. Um, a lot of them were church groups. A lot of them were entrepreneurs to rehabilitate housing and to build housing. And um, the direct impact of, of Mount Laurel was re really perif peripheral to that. Another area that your department over time became drawn into was the role of the state in regional and statewide planning. 
uh, during the Byrne administration, uh, at least one bill was introduced to create a state uh, regulatory authority that would have control over larger developments like regional shopping centers and industrial parks and the like. It didn't go very far in the legislature. In fact, I think uh, in order to get the bill printed, the governor had to prevail upon his ex-law partner, Senator Greenberg, who was here earlier today, uh, to put his name on so the bill could uh, actually get a number and be introduced and printed and didn't get very much further than that. Uh, but there were professional planners within your department, I guess, who were for this. But you were an urban mayor. New Jersey has a very strong tradition of home rule. How did you deal with sort of these debates over what was the proper role of the state in county and local planning? Well, we did have a planning department within the Department of Community Affairs and with uh, uh, David Bardeen and with Joe Hoffman, and I can't remember, I think there was someone else involved in it. Um, we had shared within and between uh, uh, interagency uh, committees, if you will, uh, the drawing up of a regional plan for the state. And uh, I couldn't help but smile to myself when you said you couldn't get legislation to have regulatory authority. We couldn't even get people to sign off on the state plan and um, it was one that certainly made a great deal of sense to me <laughs> since uh, I was part and parcy, parcel of it but um, in, in substance in, a, in lay people's terms it was kind of you know lining up where we were right at that moment and at least delineating areas that we should not be into and uh, stressing areas that it made sense to develop or redevelop and be able to say, hey, if you looked at this plan and you wanted to build your shopping center or your apartments or whatever it was, in an area designed for growth where, where uh, the infrastructure was in place and there was water and sewers and roads and a way, it was near a rail line or it was near a bus line, um, we would help you do that. But if you wanted to go out to Farmer Jones Field where there were no water, no water, no supplies, no infrastructure, uh, open space that uh, they had four little league teams playing on, and the only green trees within 50 miles, we're going to do everything we can to deter you, and we sure as goodness are not going to help you uh, where this development should not be. And that was kind of the general sense of it. And I don't think, at least even to this day, I don't understand why people, other than developers out to make a buck, uh, wouldn't sign on for it. But um, uh, it, we were never able to get anybody to agree to it. And every once in a while now, you see um, with brownfields, again, making perfect sense if they can be made safe that you develop where development is and where infrastructure is and you don't develop where uh, uh, the birds and the ducks and the geese and the deer and the antelope play. Mm -hmm. But um, and if you drive around New Jersey, I had occasion last week to go to Vineland uh, for a luncheon meeting. It's astounding, the countryside that we still have and the Brendan Byrne Forest that uh, we drove through. And then if you're at Newark Airport and driving to New Brunswick or taking the train to New Brunswick, you think, my goodness, there isn't a tree within a zillion miles. And somehow we can't get ourselves together enough to protect what we have and put development where, which would help everybody. But that's my soapbox. It didn't work 30 years ago. It's still not working. As you uh, joined the cabinet, what were cabinet meetings in the Byrne administration like? Useful, not useful? I think they were useful. I think um, it kept us in the loop. 
uh, which I think, uh, uh, you know, I can't speak for, for Brendan. He may well have shaved at it. Oh, my gosh, I've got to spend two hours with these folks again. Um, but he came across as wanting to share. This is where it's going well. This is where I'm having a problem. What are you doing about that? And it gave each of us, or at least I should only speak for me, it gave me a sense that I was part of this administration. I mean, um, there are always leaks and rumors and inside scoop. Uh, most of our newspapers and commentators all have their little thing. And I would guess that if you spend a couple of years reading about things you thought you should know in the paper, um, you would be pretty discouraged, disgruntled, or bitter. And uh, certainly the cabinet meetings precluded that. Um, not that we knew or had to know everything that was going on, but in the broad picture where Brendan wanted us to go or what was holding him back from accomplishing this or that was at least shared so that we could uh, uh, understand that, that our crisis, whatever that was, and we were always dealing in crisis, uh, was, was just a little piece of the picture in this other um, area that we didn't really know much about was, was critical at the moment. So I think in terms of sharing and openness and, and uh, drawing us in, they were effective. Did they solve the problems of the world? Were they helpful to him? I'm not so sure. Apart from formal cabinet meetings, how was your relationship with the governor's staff? We've heard suggestions during this series that, at least in the first term, when the uh, structure was somewhat less clear as to who was in charge, there was no formal chief of staff, there were a few people who perhaps acted in the governor's behalf without talking to each other. and so forth. Did you see that confusion or how was your personal sort of uh, perspective on the uh, uh, governor staff relationship with the de individual departments? Well, I don't know and I can't speak for any other administration because I was only in one administration. Uh, but um, I think that the individual <coughs> departments or the individual commissioners uh, had a much better relationship with the governor than they did with his immediate staff. Uh, part of that is akin to the uh, receptionist in, in your doctor's office. I mean, she can be a rogue or she can hang up on you or she can yell at you or she can give you an appointment or she cannot give you an appointment and you still really love your doctor and uh, yet she's not doing that on her own I mean and I think there was some of that and my guess is it's probably in all administrations there were some who uh, uh, you know drop everything this is the governor's office and uh, you'd run like goodness and find out if there was some intern using the governor's <laughs> office uh, to uh, show how important he or she uh, was and, and uh, you know, can report when he goes back to class or she goes back to class uh, in September that they, you know, had cabinet officers at their beck and call. And I think that's fairly standard in, a, in any kind of a group. Uh, those near the rich and famous wear that aura and I don't think it's very serious I don't think anybody uh, gets fooled more than once by that um, I think there were some uh, uh, in council's office or the governor's office or the secretary of state's office who had at any given moment their agenda the governor's agenda and you weren't always clear which was which. But um, uh, I can't say that I had overwhelming problems with the staff, uh, probably no different than anybody else's. Listen to any other cabinet officers, we'd often be tearing our hair out of 
one or the other. Um, I had incredible problems, as I guess everybody did with the uh, uh, the treasurer's office or the budget office. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the treasurer initiated uh, a proposal to restructure the executive departments, which included consolidating the various units of your department, Community Affairs, with other ex executive departments, and that put you in a very difficult position, didn't it? I'm not sure I understand you. You well, mean Wayne Dumont wanting to do away with the department? No, uh, Dick Leone wanting to restructure the department. My department? Mm -hmm. I don't remember that at all. Maybe I blocked I that out of my mind. Possibly, what are you talking about? Possibly. Oh, I remember. <laughs> but why don't we um, why don't we move on? Uh, I think it was in the second or third year of the of the first term. One I remember was Wayne Dumont. You know, he always every year putting a bill to do away with the Department of Community Affairs. Well, what was your reaction to those bills? Fought like man. Successfully, I might add. I guess one of the arguments for abolishing or whittling down the department was that the federal money that had led to the creation of many of the urban poverty programs and urban revitalization programs had been drying up uh, over time. Oh, significantly. So how did you deal with that with, with greatly reduced resources? Well, one of the big issues, of course, is that bond issue that I just referred to, uh, the federal, uh, the, the housing bond issue, which was a state-funded bond issue, uh, which provided resources to do housing that was not going to be available anymore from the, from the federal government. Uh, the other issue was to fight like mad for the federal dollars that were available. And um, there was a young man in our department who uh, came up with a formula. Again, it came to mind recently with the Homeland Security and him. You know, the dangers of uh, Utah are more extreme than the dangers of New York City. Uh, federal formulas. You live and die by federal formulas if you're a beneficiary, which the state of New Jersey was. And Bruce Sachs was able to develop a formula for housing support, Section 8 housing, that um, if not favored, at least leveled the playing field. Uh, and I don't pretend to understand it but made sure that the formula included a uh, provision for age of housing stock, which favored New York, Boston, uh, Newark uh, over, uh, you know, brand new communities. I mean, we go back to the Revolutionary War and the whole middle is, uh, you know, less than uh, 50 or 100 years old, some of those communities. And so that's the kind of thing that you do to ensure that whatever aid is available is uh, coming to the fore. Um, the whole question of local government finance, we were able to, and I hope and think they still do it, but we were able to certify every government, every municipal budget in this state. You know, there was no fun and games and make-believe money. It's, um, you know, part of the reason taxes are so high, but it's because every dollar is accounted for. And so I think we had a mission. Well, you can tell I feel we had a mission. Uh, regardless, it was not just a poverty program, and it was not dismissed as that. We had uh, real people doing real work. and had some accomplishments to our credit. Well, moving from policy to politics, uh, the Byrne administration's popularity plummets with the passage of the income tax, and people begin to refer to him as one-term Byrne, OTB. Um, 
How did you view that uh, in terms of his political prospects as a cabinet officer and did you offer any advice to him or others close to him as to how to get out of this sort of political uh, uh, trough? Well, I wasn't in the position of uh, offering advice to anyone. Uh, I think, you know, I was one of the lieutenants out in the trenches and I think I did what uh, so many of us did look for ways to showcase accomplishments, whether it was uh, cutting the ribbon on a senior citizen housing or whether it was uh, looking at uh, refurbished, renovated brownstones in Hoboken. Um, some of the things in, in my department, we also had the Department of Aging, whether it was a senior uh, um, health arama I mean, little things and big things. Um, I mean, we, he was the captain of our ship. And so I think what we all tried to do was not only accomplish what we set out to do, which we were working hard at, but to be able to showcase those accomplishments as the accomplishments of Brendan T. Byrne, which in fact they were. Mm. He had to take the blame, he had to get the credit. With the polls showing him so low in public uh, approval, uh, did you think he had a chance to uh, win uh, when he stood for re-election? Oh, sure. Always have a chance to win. You work hard. And he did. Mm -hmm. What about in the primary? He. His, his political weakness attracted several candidates which split the anti-Byrne vote. That was a key factor that many have cited in terms of his winning renomination. Um, talk a little bit, I guess, about the other candidates in that race and the ones you knew. Joe Hoffman was a fellow cabinet member. Uh, did you find that sort of a, a particularly egregious uh, incident of betrayal by a cabinet officer in the Byrne administration? Or? Well, I don't think I'd put it quite that strongly, but yes, I disagreed with that whole thing. I thought that, uh, you know, it was disloyal. And um, I thought Brendan was a better candidate. I mean, I liked Joe and I worked with him and I think he uh, accomplished, uh, uh, you know, wonders in, uh, many of his programs in the Department of Labor, I believe. Um, but no, you don't do that, I don't think. Did you take any or special political role or were you given any special political assignments with urban mayors, with uh, Middlesex County people, with uh, women uh, in the Bern re-election in 1977? Well, same old, same old, as I said earlier, have mouth will travel. Uh, I was uh, very much an ardent supporter, and um, any opportunity I had to participate, whether it was the Middlesex County organization or the uh, women's organizations, uh, you know, if, if I was asked, and in several cases represented the governor, so I guess I take that back, I was asked. Several times I represented uh, uh, as a surrogate at some campaign thing or another, mm. the governor. So I suppose uh, I must have been doing something right. And from your perspective, uh, how was he a candidate in 1977 compared to 1973? Well, I think uh, we've all agreed on this over and over again. Uh, he certainly learned how to conduct himself and how to speak and represent people. And he had something to show for it. I mean, um, it. I think as we're seeing now with Jim Florio, um, the tax issue, although you certainly suffer from it, I mean, reasonable people understand that you have to pay taxes and you have to raise taxes. And uh, so I don't think that um, it was so desperate 
the tax thing automatically meant no one would vote for Byrne. I think a lot of that was ginned up by the the media who like, I mean, they want things to be interesting. It's not a ho-hum. Here he comes again, you know, he's elected then, now he's going to be elected again, ho-hum, ho-ho. Um, part of it was that. Part of it is that that rock brown cadre that is against taxes no matter what, for what, um, is not as large as many people think. They're vocal, uh, but uh, reasonable people I think you can reach mm. within well, reason. One of the programs he ran on in 1977 in his re-election campaign was his uh, effort to get legislation to protect the Pinelands, uh, even though the Department of Community Affairs was probably not the lead department. No, that was David. More likely the Department of Environmental Protection, but your department did produce a lot of the planning and a lot of the data that was used in developing the uh, uh, concept of the uh, Pinelands Preservation Act. Uh, how did you sort of look at that and also in terms of the home rule issues as New, New Jersey took on this much more assertive role in regulating such a large expanse of the state? Well, I think that I tried at least to point to the success of the Meadowlands. I mean, that's two counties, that's 17 towns. Um, I'm not sure it wasn't a miracle in terms of getting it together, and I was not there at the point of its origination. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not that close to it now that I know how it's evolving, but I know what it was like then. And um, it was truly a miracle. And what it meant was that uh, what should be protected was in fact protected and what should be developed was in fact developed uh, and uh, the planners and the engineers and the developers um, were able to do their thing within limits in a very open and public way and um, I mean, I thought that the, the the stadium and the racetrack were absolutely wonderful. And I was out in a rowboat, more often than not, looking at heron and shrimp and blue crabs and looking up at then the World Trade Center. I mean, minutes from Manhattan. And we were able to uh, clean up the water. Not totally clean yet, but certainly it's not an open sewer anymore, which it was, the river. We have housing on that river. We have shopping and paved roads instead of, you know, a polyglot of uh, warehouses and uh, broken down trucks and abandoned uh, opportunities of, you know, the last 30 years, junk heaps. I don't know how else to say it. And instead we have the Meadowlands. People go there to shop. They go there to watch the track. They live there. And um, we had a young engineer and a young environmentalist, chief environmentalist, chief engineer. And I really viewed my job then is to, you know, clear the politics out of the way and let these two young men do their job and do it well, which they did. And so that was the model for the for the Meadowland, uh, for the Pinelands. And Dick Sullivan, I mean, he just been around forever and knew what he needed and wanted, and people respected him. And uh, the governor led the charge, and it worked. Another high-profile urban revitalization initiative in the Byrne administration was the Atlantic City program to use casino gambling to revive the the Cade Resort, and your department had a very significant role in the planning and the sort of development of the ideas for Atlantic City. How did you personally feel about casino gambling in New Jersey, for or against? Well, uh, personally, I, I guess I could have lived without it, and I could have lived for it. I think it's fun. Do you remember how you voted in the referendum? Oh, I'd forgotten it was a referendum. You're right. Oh, yeah. I suppose I voted for it. Um, 
My mother loved going. <laughs> and uh, I don't have any sense of outrage over gambling. Um, I just don't get to do it very often. And I've never afforded it, I suppose, because you have to plan on what you're going to lose, because I never win. Uh, but I don't have any strong feelings against it. I think that, uh, again, it um, didn't totally live up to its promise in that it didn't remake Atlantic City is not Nirvana, and it's very hard to see um, a lot of uh, success off the boardwalk. But there were some successes. I was down for a, uh, a community school, uh, and that was before, I mean, now there's a community school everywhere. But that was probably one of the first in New Jersey. It was certainly one of the first that I had ever seen. That was open 24 hours a day. It wasn't locked at 3 o'clock. Where was that? In Atlantic City. And uh, it had a daycare center, and it had a meeting room for community groups, as well as a full-fledged school, had an auditorium. I mean, it took my breath away. It was beautiful. And I think that was one of the fruits of, of uh, gambling. Uh, but it, um, in terms of housing, didn't go as far and as fast. There are some very nice communities. I personally was upset at uh, uh, building a road or a tunnel or whatever it was they built through a stable, steady, middle-class neighborhood. I thought that was the reverse of what we needed and wanted for Atlantic City and for casino gambling. But um, we employ a lot of people, and uh, we're not getting paid <laughs> as we speak. But uh, we've provided a lot of jobs. And I know there's been some concern about not enough jobs for the people who live in Atlantic City. But the people who actually live in the community not many of them are up and available and ready to be a casino worker. They're old, they're on disability, or they're too young, or they're not educated. And so there's still a lot of work to be done in Atlantic City, but I would say on the plus side, at least there's a resource that we haven't tapped enough. But we've also done other things around the state. Uh, since that time with uh, uh, casino revenues. I'm not quite sure how that works. Uh, you know, it's after my time. But it's another way of accomplishing purposes for the citizens that live in New Jersey. After Governor Byrne gets reelected re in November 1977, were you still concerned about what came next uh, in terms of the future of your department or your future in the Byrne administration? Were there worries about that? No, there, were, well, there were always worries about the department because whenever it came to budget time, it was, you know, what is it that you do over there and so on. And uh, we had uh, some of the controversial areas. The housing was a area of controversy. The uh, women's division was an area of controversy. The local finance board was an area of con controversy. And an overwhelming area of controversy was the HFA. And so there were a lot of people who thought, you know, if the whole thing disappeared, um, what would we care? Uh, they're only in the way and, uh, and so on. So that was ongoing all of the time. Um, and didn't have the same neat little box that the Department of Labor has, or the Department of Agriculture has. And so uh, uh, expand, contract, contract, expand. Uh, some of the stuff uh, we got, although we didn't want it, and uh, some of the stuff we, we tried to make work, and by and large it, it went either way. So uh, I was always worried. What about your personal situation? When did you hear about whether you would be continuing with in the cabinet and from whom? I continued in the cabinet in the second term, uh, I guess for the first year, and then, um, and I, you'd be better 
since maybe you've looked some of this stuff mm -hmm. up, and I haven't. Uh, but Joe Lafonte uh, uh, was coming back from Congress. There was, um, and I forget for whom, was it for Frank? Guarini? 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 Yeah. Guarini was going to Congress and LaFonte was coming home and he'd been speaker during the income tax fight. And um, so the only place that made sense for him was the Department of Community Affairs. And so I was asked, I guess by the governor, I really think when face to face came it, it was the governor might have been Jerry English, I can't really remember, uh, would I go to the Meadowlands? And um, so I was, I guess it was at the end of the first year. Well, it had to be because it was uh, December, I guess. I went up to the Meadowlands and took Bill Spahn. As executive director. As director of the Meadowlands. I'd been chairman of the Meadowlands Commission as commissioner. That's kind of automatic. Well, that role gives you a much more sort of hands-on job, doesn't it, in terms of dealing with a specific piece of property and uh, a well, lot Well, that's of how I got to know the uh, Chet Matson and George Casino so yeah. well. They, smart, they were smart, able, and they were the first time, at least in my history of, of government, where you could sit in the same room with environmentalists and engineers and come out with, uh, with a solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were doers and very, very good. So it was an exciting and fun time. But, um, and in some ways it was um, uh, more direct a uh, couple of issues came up, um, you know, that, that Brendan felt very strongly about, and I was able to lead the charge and get uh, a couple of unanimous votes through the commission. Yeah. Not sure they've voted unanimously yeah. since. And um, do you recall what those issues were? No, okay. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to ask. I, okay. I tried to breeze okay. over that senior moment memory. So I was up there for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. and uh, then I uh, I left government, state government. Did you get more of a sense of accomplishment uh, in that role because you could sort of see things happening, either so the wetlands getting cleaned up or buildings going up? Was that more of a, uh, a real uh, opportunity for you to sort of sit back and say, well, gee, we did this? Then the more abstract role as a commissioner of a department. Well, it certainly was more exciting. Um, you know, Sonny Werblin was chairman of the Sports Authority. Um, I served part-time as uh, a Sports Authority member for a brief period on another issue. Um, the, the racetrack was built, the uh, stadium was under construction. Uh, the arena, I think, um, no, I guess the arena came later. I don't think I was part of the arena. So it was fun and it was exciting. Uh, and it, it also had some issues of its own. I mean, uh, uh, it's pretty exciting to be the garbage queen of New Jersey. And uh, very mundane, but very difficult. Uh, situation with the garbage and uh, that's when we put in the baler uh, to compact the garbage. I mean we were being overwhelmed with garbage and um, that's when we, so we built the baler. Uh, that was a, an area of uh, controversy. Um, they said you know it had to be a union and it had to be uh, I guess the laborers union and I said he's in jail I'm not going to negotiate with anybody in jail I want the operating engineers and I said uh, they're too expensive and I said the horn blows and those races go off every night regardless of the dispute the operating engineers are absolutely the most effective people around and they get the job done and then you have your arguments, but the job gets done. 
And so they did. They represented the biller, and uh, I was proud and excited about that. Hard to get excited about garbage. Mm -hmm. In New Jersey, that's uh, not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, life doesn't end with the Byrne administration. What have you done uh, after the end of uh, the Byrne years? I um, worked for Johnson & Johnson. I went back to Johnson & Johnson. And uh, I was there until I retired. And so I've, uh, uh, I think, done well. Um, served on various boards and commissions. I was trustee, uh, first woman trustee, chairman of St. Peter's College. I was a trustee at the hospital in New Brunswick, St. Peter's, surrounded by St. Peter's here, uh, UMDNJ, um, Trinity College, um, uh, various committees, commissions was on uh, Governor Cahill's Tax Policy Commission. And how about your family? What are they up to? Uh, my daughter is an elected councilwoman in the city of New Brunswick, so maybe I'm starting my own dynasty. And um, my youngest is um, a finance officer for the North Ward Cultural Center in Newark. Bought a gorgeous big old house by Branchbrook Park and is the father of my two younger grandchildren. Betsy's the, fa the mother of my oldest. I only have three boys. Uh, he's graduated from the University of Pennsylvania like his mother and his aunt. And um, I lost to my middle son in February. Before we close, let's uh, talk about the Byrne administration and Governor Byrne and the history of New Jersey. I don't want to be pretentious about it, but what do you see sort of as the lasting accomplishments? And again, is there an unfinished agenda that you know might have uh, worked out better if decisions were made in the 1970s that would impact us now? But uh, let's start with the, the, the positive. What do you think the Byrne administration's lasting accomplishments are for New Jersey? Well, I think we've talked about most of them, not most of them, but certainly we've talked about some of the highlights already. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Atlantic City, Pinelands, Meadowlands. Um, they were all started by him, but they were brought to fruition by him. And I think they had an impact. Uh, I think that the income tax um, has a lasting impact. In, um, I think that we will someday, somehow, uh, perhaps probably not regionalize governments, but at least regionalize services and uh, be able to provide for the needs of our people um, without pricing them out of the state. I mean, right now, 30 years later, uh, we're at a point where, where the people who are very rich are leaving because they don't want to pay the taxes and they don't want their estates tied up. And the people who are very poor can't afford to stay because there's no option for them. And um, so we still have lots of things to do in New Jersey. But I think on balance, Burn and the Burn administration and the people he surrounded him with um, tried to make things better and um, succeeded in some and didn't succeed in others and I don't think you can ask for more of a record than that. Thank you. <laughs>